Here's another much requested video about one of my favorite of the mini bands directly influenced by Meshuga. May I humbly introduce Vildharta. <laughs> All of their music is great, but as always, I have to limit myself somehow if I'm going to finish this video in a week. So I'm going to talk about three short riffs that I like from the middle of Langst Midan, the second track from their Thousands of Evils EP, which will work as a cool introduction to some of the ways they've taken Meshuggah's basic ideas and ran with them. Vildharta has plenty of riffs that are within the bounds of what Meshuggah might write, at least theoretically. I've got a whole long video about what that means, uh, so go check that out if you want to learn some of those basics. But a lot of Vildharta's music is actually pretty different under the hood, even if on a zoomed out level it's all still based on rhythmic tholly, unpredictable low guitar stuff over halftime metal backbeats. There are a few obvious differences, most of which are timbral. You get more clean guitar stuff in Vildharta's music. Occasional clean singing. If my head was silence. Generally more stuff going on in higher guitar registers. And, <laughs> and not really any solos. Other stuff is less obvious, and that brings me to part one of this video. Vildharta is much less bound by regular 4 4 hypermeasures than Meshuga is. That's kind of the whole thing with Meshuggah, is that they fit almost all of their riff sections into 4 or 8 or 16 or 32 measures of 4-4. Four, four. Vildharta doesn't stick as rigidly to this. For example, the first riff of the section I'm talking about today is basically two six-measure chunks. a little ambiguous where to slice it, the second riff section doesn't last for 16 measures. third and final riff section I'm looking at today lasts for 10 measures with a little half measure upbeat tacked on to the beginning. This means that maybe the whole it's all in 4-4 argument is a little weaker for Vildharta than Meshuggah. And I think it means their music sounds a little more angular and maybe a little less predictable. They still generally have 4-4 backbeats throughout all of this stuff, but not the larger 4-4 structures that Meshuggah sticks to. Vildharta's music is also generally less cyclical than Meshuggah's where a ton of Meshuggah's riffs act more or less like conventional song sections, as in you get a verse riff or two, a chorus riff, etc., and they come back a few times in a song, a lot of Vildharta's music, maybe Thal of it, is through composed, which means riffs don't come back once they get left behind. Vildharta's music is also more linear within these riffs. The whole thing of Meshuggah's music is that they normally have short, asymmetrical patterns that get looped exactly against the drum backbeat. Vildharta does have some riffs that do this, but the more typical thing for them is to make subtle changes to the guitar pattern as it goes, both in pitch and rhythm. The first riff in this passage does this. In these diagrams, I'm going to use attack point analysis because I think it makes it easiest to see these sorts of patterns. Basically, in this example, when I have a 1 above the notes, it's an eighth note, a 2 is a quarter note, a 3 is a dotted quarter note, 4 is a half note, etc. And I'm assigning them based on how long it is until the next note shows up. So what we have in this riff is a rhythmic pattern that lasts for 18 quarter notes. 
Then we get six quarter notes into repeating it so that it fills out six measures of 4-4. Four, four. Then we get the six measure chunk again. This repetition is made less obvious by the fact that the pitches associated with these rhythms change and there's one small change to the rhythmic pattern itself in the second chunk. It's a pretty abstract take on Meshuggah's basic style. The third riff from this section does the same thing, but with a longer pattern that's harder to keep track of and that changes in length. It starts with a five note upbeat type thing, then starts the actual pattern, which lasts for 32 eighth notes. On the second cycle of this, though, the pitches are a little different and there's a three eighth note tag added to the end. The third cycle is the same as the first, and then the fourth cycle is cut off after 21 eighth notes, which, as I pointed out before, means that this whole thing lasts for 10 measures of 12-8. Add this to the fact that these patterns phase against this unchanging 12-8 beat, and it makes for a very slippery riff. that comes between these two stretches this idea of riff repetition to the point of breaking. Here there are a few little ideas that show up a few times, but there doesn't seem to be any pattern, even a faltered one, controlling when they appear. Ricky Wagner, a German opera composer with some influential thoughts about music and some really obnoxious thoughts about people, had this idea of endless melody in his operas, where there was the feeling that melodies were just constantly being spun out. I think part of the effect of Wildhart's linearity is something like endless gent. When I listen to their thalbums, I feel like I'm being dropped into an endless ocean with gent as far as the eye can see and new riffs constantly popping up and being left behind. The other interesting thing about the lack of repetition or faltered repetition is that it problem faultizes the idea that Wildharte's music is polymetric. I'm not alone in distrusting this word in the first place, but here it seems even less useful than usual, because while we could say that the drums are still outlining a quadruple meter backbeat, the guitars are definitely not outlining a stable counter pattern. So basically, the two most common things that people say about Meshuggah's music that it's polymetric and or all in 4-4 make even less sense for Wildharta. All right, if I look uncontrollably excited to you, that's because the last thing that Wildharta does a lot that isn't in Meshuggah's playbook is use tempo changes. This short bit of Langstamidon has several, switching back and forth from beats around 75 BPM and 90 BPM several times. <laughs> Tempo changes are interesting. In terms of numbers, the tempo ratio is about 4 to 5, so we could say that the quarter note quintuplet gets the beat going one direction, and then the quarter note becomes the quintuplet going the other direction. This isn't super crazy as an idea, at least Carbom does this a fair amount. But quintuplets don't actually show up anywhere in the music to prepare the tempo changes. They don't show up before the tempo actually changes. If the band is thinking of these quintuplets as a pivot duration, they're definitely not giving it away in how they play it. Because of this, I think these changes sound more like direct tempo changes, i.e. ones where it sounds like everyone just magically lands on a new tempo that's unrelated to the previous one. 
the effect can be pretty jarring and cool, as I think it is here. The last riff also changes from a simple subdivision, which is two notes per beat, to a compound subdivision with three eighth notes per beat. I've talked in other places, in my Carbong paper, my Animals Leader video, uh, about pulse-preserving tactus modulations. This is kind of the inverse of that, which why not? Let's call it a tactus preserving pulse modulation. So basically in these changes, the beat is saying the same. We're still head banging. The cymbals are doing the same thing. Um, but now we have three uh, subdivisions per beat instead of two. of these tempo modulations, which happen a few times, is that each riff gets its own distinct rhythmic world. I said in another video that I think tempo exploration is one of the major up-and-coming trends in progressive metal. I think this is another example of how that can sound, where instead of each riff just getting its own pattern or time signature or whatever, each of these riffs is also distinguished from what comes before by a change of tempo and or subdivision. And combined with all linearity and irregularity of the hypermeter that I talked about in the first part of this video, I think it makes this dense string of riffs sound super angular and kinetic. Thanks for watching. Please spike, coronet, and dubscribe. And if that doesn't satisfy your craving for ways to support me making these videos, I also have a Patreon now and would be honored to receive your patronage. See ya.